Before this reform, the duty of providing arguments for the sentence wasn't applied because this duty is linked to the idea of a legal process, getting Article 3 of the fundamental letter as the um, constitutionally guaranteed right. Our legislators in Law 20,600 has decided to remind us ministers of, of tribunals that our freedom to assess evidence and to resort to these logic laws maximum experience and science is not absolute because everywhere anywhere we need to take into consideration the multiplicity the severity accuracy consistency of the task that of uh, uh, and therefore the exam will lead very logically to the conviction we have had in this situation, the sentence as a procedural fact uh, becomes a sort of communication that don't, not only contains a response to the litigating parties, but also the intellectual process allowing to arrive to that response. This valuation and, uh, pr and grounding process, as well as intellectual operations, concerns the legislator that to see to it establishes one of the most drastic measures offered by, by procedural law. Article Article 26, paragraph 4, says that when the sentence has been issued with an open breach of the rules of uh, evidence assessment in accordance with constructive criticism, this uh, they can ask for annulment in cases where this is evident. So the sanction for sentences that breach the rules of constructive criticism is the most serious of procedural order. And this means that uh, the confidence placed in magistrates not be betrayed or deviated or that may be perceived as unfair. And even this apparently clear decision of the legislator uh, includes definitions when something can be considered manifest or evident. Uh, so a breach of the constructive criticism that is not manifest can be tolerated. Well, there are many problems in this, but everything converges towards one single point. <laughs> the uh, vague uh, standard. And one can say that directing human affairs in a vague manner leaves uncertainty, uncertainty for persons authorized to apply the standard. This uh, fear of uh, uncertainty, which is the other side of this complaint, involves a definition of the law and a hastiness to find a concept so as to objectively establish what is sana critica and the content of its rules. What would happen if we change the approach to sana critica seeking responses? If we observe what authors of other legal systems have said, we find it's not necessary to eliminate the vague part of the law for the rule of law. But we need <laughs> a vagueness uh, of rules. And if the system has independent uh, tribunals, uh, well, we can have all that we expect of a legal system. The vagueness of the standard has allowed constructive criticism from the very uh, first steps until this moment to persist based on rules, generally accepted rules and regulations, and at the same time adapts to procedures and different organic structures like those of uh, criminal procedure, 
family law, uh, uh, antitrust, and the environment. In its definition, it has allowed for the incorporation of science to solve legal conflicts that due to its characteristics would not be solved without a scientific knowledge, as it is the case of environmental issues. Allows to adapt uh, to the dynamics of scientific knowledge that uh, moves very fast. And then finally, the vagueness of this institution have not prevented tribunals and justices of the country to play their roles, has stimulated them to make greater efforts to produce better and more motivated sentences. So with this small appeal to continue thinking about constructive criticism, once again, I would like to welcome you to the second day of the third International Forum on Environmental Justice. Hopefully, it will be most fruitful. Thank you. So thank you for that welcoming address of uh, Mr. Felipe Sabando. Our next speaker is a renowned uh, league, uh, lawyer uh, of Chile, uh, has master's in Europe and graduate and PhD. In 2015, assumed the position of Controller General of Chile and Executive Secretary of uh, Hola, Since 2018, he's the member of UN uh, Auditors Board. We'll now present a master lecture, Mr. Jorge Bermúdez Soto. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Bueno, muchas gracias por, por la invitación. Thank you for the invitation and presentation. I will try in this brief presentation in these minutes I have, I'm going to try to speak about the environmental law, uh, how is the status today, and what is the controller's office doing for that same concept that one could consider environmental rule of law. And I would uh, thank I was taken two minutes and I haven't spoken, not even 30 seconds. No, no, no. Uh, I would like to thank those that invited me for not uh, entitling the presentation and just saying master lecture, because with that I had much more freedom in order to raise something that is novel and could be of interest to you. And of course, tonight, work or last night I was working at the last minute in order to have this presentation. I will speak about the environmental context, something that you know. It's very difficult to speak about new things on this, but at least some context words. Secondly, I would like to refer to the importance of the intervention of the state uh, administration in the protection of the environment, then what the controller's office is doing. And there, I would like to know how we controllers has endorsed the SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and we have taken them very seriously. And secondly, I would like to give you an example as to 
what we did in the decontamination plan of Quintero, Puchunca, Villa, and Ventanas has been highly debated. But I would like you to know firsthand what is it that we in the, at the controller's office did. And then some thoughts on the prospects of the environmental rule of law. Now, from the point of view of context, the first thing I'd like to say is that today we are facing a state that is defined, and Dr. Jose Pardo this afternoon will say it. It is like a guarantor state. The way of intervening in the life and society is through the regulation, through the permits, and through the control and supervision. So I was surprised when you said that the number of controls had declined, because in the end, that is a signal that maybe we are not truly supervising or controlling or monitoring what is happening insofar as protection of the environment, especially if we consider that there is a discussion of what is it that needs to be controlled by the superintendent. So the state is a guarantor of environmental protection. And secondly, that guarantees for something, at least to maintain status quo and for future generations in virtue of this intergenerational solidarity will have an environment at least similar to what we have today. I don't want to say better, it's ever more difficult, but at least similar to what we have today. And thirdly, of course, there is an uh, uh, a very close relationship between that uh, uh, state, the environment, and we as a human species. We define ourselves as a successful species, too, ex too successful precisely because of adapting to the environment. Are we going to be able to adapt to the future environment once the temperature continues to go up, or the sea level will continue to go up, or when we have food shortage? Will we adapt? I don't say today nor in 50 years, but in 200 years, will that be possible for everyone? That's going to be difficult, quite difficult. So we have clearly in mind that it is the state that assumes an environmental function, an environmental role, one of environmental protection. And to the extent that environmental property are deteriorated, that has a direct impact on the way of living. Now, if the environment is protected, you ensure the existence and survival of the human being, of all of us. And that is something that needs to be assumed by the state. The state has, I don't only mean the state as an administration, but a state in general. Of course, there is a direct relationship between the way we live and the environment, direct relationship between environment and society. Each one of these pictures shows how we impact on the environment, depending on how we settle and how the environment affects us. And there is, and this relationship generates uh, uh, behavior in society. And with this, I'd like to dwell one second. This year, I was struck by this news. And it uh, refers to how the environment, a, a polluted environment, has an influence on the behavior of persons. But not if you are depressed or le less depressed or happy or less happy, but in, it influences on basic things. A contaminated environment has an effect on the ethics of persons, morality. And when you have more pollution, air pollution, persons not only are more anxious, but tend to behave worse. And therefore, the crime rate increases as contamination or air pollution increases. So maybe when you set up all these public policy roundtables on, on security and safety, you should also include the environmental approach if you want to combat crime. And this affects us directly. Well, that said, these context words, I would like to refer how the state participates and affects this, going to the legal grounds. 
And here we need to start from the constitutional uh, standard, Article 19, Number 8, in the second sentence uh, says, it is the duty of the state to see to the law and the rights not be affected and therefore uh, protect nature. So we have an environmental, the state has an environmental function and uh, role, and this is related to the most intimate uh, roles. Usually, we don't consider this part of the institution, uh, only the law. But if you enshrine that in the Constitution, you have two options. Either you enshrine the, the law or the duty. The uh, German char uh, charter has enshrined the duty. As we are more environmentalists, we have both things. We have law, uh, the right, and the duty. And therefore, the environment is better protected here in Chile. Uh, the right and the duty. This is a slide that I obtained from a presentation two years back, and as I liked it, I brought it again. And of course, if you think in the administrative participation, you need to think about the environmental management instruments or the, uh, the superintendency and uh, the control that is uh, uh, that resides in the environmental tribunal and the habit or environmental habeas corpus or uh, protection recourse. The uh, trend of jurisprudence that uh, as there were environmental tribunals, this habeas corpus would decline. No, that did not happen. And therefore, protection recourse are two ways to be used in a parallel manner. I say this for for an guess. There is an agency in our institutionality, which is the General Controller's Office, that exercises a twofold control of what the state administration is doing, and that is control auditing, the auditing control auditor, which is a posteriori, after the fact, and it is the auditor uh, that sees the compliance. But also there is a juridical control, a legal one, which is prior, which is one of legality. So the controller's office has two souls, a very marked legal soul related to that uh, uh, legality control. On, on the other hand, that uh, soul, which is that of an auditor that controls and monitors. So you cannot remove from the equation the role played by the controller's office. And if we go back to the different areas of environmental protection, if we think not only in decontamination plans or regulations, but we think uh, about uh, for example, urban development rules or standards, there is also a role played by the controller's office. And uh, we have been highly criticized recently by uh, stakeholders like uh, the Chilean Chamber of Construction uh, regarding uh, the urban development master plans. And when the controller's office says, look, there is no possibility to construction, unlimited construction uh, in uh, vertical uh, buildings. And these vertical ghettos have been illegal because that leads to lack of safety and uh, a series of problems. So what happens with institutionality? First, I will say, progress has been made in recent years. We cannot speak about the new environmental institutionality. We are missing a service uh, focused on biodiversity, true, but progress has been made. Only uh, recently, a couple of years ago, uh, environmental jurisdiction was completed with the first environmental tribunal in Antofagasta in the north of the country. And this is, it's evident that the environment is dynamic. So it would be desirable that instruments for environmental management be dynamic and not be stone engraved like 25 years ago. We speak about environmental management. And in the country, we apply the same instruments to all can, to the whole country, uh, like if uh, we could face the problems with those same tools in the, uh, everywhere from north to south. That has been an error. 
environmental management instrument should be updated, should be revised uh, regularly. But that is a bit too much to ask. Well, they should respond e um, easily to the challenges we face. Today, we find uh, instruments that are not enshrined in the legislation, if you think about action plans or sustainable development or protocols, but they're not there. So uh, from the point of view uh, of informality, they give an account of those needs. But if this does not happen, then there will be a trend, permanent, not growing deep, but permanent trend to judicialize all of the environmental uh, matters. So what should environmental administration do? And as it is one, it has to be ruled by the principle of legality. But this legality principle is not only a limit on action, but more importantly, is that that principle of legality, what it does, it enables environmental administration to act. Many of the complaints filed to the controller's office and uh, reports, it's not because uh, they did something, but it's because they are not doing something. They are not controlling. They are not exercising competencies. It's really the complaint is to have the environmental administration administration out of passive attitude. And so legality principles should not be as an excuse so to, as to say, no, I cannot do this. But the one that is promoting me to do something and get out of passive uh, attitude. And that legality principle should be viewed not only as formal legality, but principles also should, principles of environmental law should be included. And some of them are in our legislation. And we need to bear in mind that the instruments that are implemented need to be controlled. Yes, in some way they need control. And with this, now I go to the third item. What's the role of the controller's office? And the first part, I'd like to refer to the sustainable development goals. In these SDGs, as you know, they are the ones in the 2030 agenda of the UN. And all of them, the 17 uh, SDGs uh, uh, are uh, uh, have specific goals. They have a responsibility. They have a role to to fulfill at different paces, of course, but no one be left behind in so far as reaching this 2030 agenda, which is something that it will be day after tomorrow. One is already late in this. However, the UN has entrusted, has uh, really uh, express the role of superior EFS have play in controlling and supervising the compliance of the SDGs. And if you take this very seriously, it involves an enormous task. And that's something controllers office need to do or the tribunals in the world should do about these SDGs. We have included in our control activities all the SDGs. And I'll give you examples of different years so that at least in what refers to controller's office, to our uh, controlling mechanisms, we have included the SDGs. In 2016, these are some of the audits we've uh, implemented in the environmental institutions. Here you have the number of the report, the institution involved, and in all of them, all of them are related to one SDGs. Sustainability, of course, are always present. Those that are related to access to drinkable water, to clean production mechanisms, uh, to um, uh, deal with food shortage, uh, shortage. But the core business of the controller's office is the fight against corruption is so always, always present, and that is SDG number 16. 
and that is the unaccount of 2016. 2017, we increased coverage indeed. And look what is there in the Under Secretariat of Foreign Affairs or Deputy Foreign Minister. We need to really see what's the progress of implementation of SDGs. And it is this Deputy Ministry, Foreign Ministry, the one to give an account of the progress made in the different SDGs. And it's important to exercise control over them. And if you think about the SDG of zero hunger in the world, this target of SAG has a lot to say. And uh, there is an audit to um, uh, food uh, harmlessness. And uh, uh, there are some results there that are not that good. Or if you think about sustainable production, the audit to the National Petroleum Company, the first one there, on what has the uh, cleaning or sanitation process of those uh, oil wells that are closed. Uh, that is a tremendous liability, environmental liability. And uh, the Undersecretariat of the uh, Environment that has no uh, action plan for Kalama. This uh, audit is very, very important because there it is. It, why didn't you do something when you had to? I mean, that place, Takama, Atacama, why the contamination plan was not implemented. The decontamination plan was not implemented. And that was a very significant audit to that uh, uh, office under Secretariat of the North. And this year we have different activities. For example, there is an audit in protected marine protected areas, administration plans for those areas. And there you conclude not only you need to create a network of uh, parks uh, like the Patagonia or a uh, uh, submarine network like that of Rapa Nui, but you need to manage these networks. And the political decision of creating them is so important. But even more important is to provide these offices with the resources so as to sustainably manage those spaces. So at least from the point of view of controlling and supervision, these involve longer reports and that are related to the SDGs. But from the point of view of supervision and controlling, we have incorporated the SDGs apart from other activities that we have conducted. In our folders, we incorporated the SDGs because these are made of recyclable material. That is one of the things that we do in the controller's office by incorporating the SDGs. And now I would like to point out a more specific case regarding the control done by the office of the controller. And this has to do with the PPDAs. And I will let you know about how these were applied in Concon, Quintero, and Puchoncavi, and the plan in the case of Ventanas. The role that we have at the controller's office is the legality control, that prior control before the plan is valid to see if the plan is made in accordance with the law and with the rulings. And as you may see, these environmental management instruments are very important because they tend to two things. One thing is to come out of a saturation situation, and therefore the emission levels are decreased so that we can have that saturation eliminated from the area or to go back to a normal situation. Therefore, we have two pieces of information with the plan. First, a primary standard in order to determine which is the standard that we want to apply in that environment. And secondly, it has to have 
an action from the authorities in the sense that once those measurements are taken, we can state that the, there is a statement on a Latin zone or a saturated zone. And then we start creating the plan. And this is the way in which it was done in the case of Concon, Quintero, Puchoncavi, and Ventanas that I will tell you about right now. If you do not know this area, these are the pictures that show us how the industry works. It is the facilities of the National Oil Company, which is basically tanks and facilities to receive hydrocarbons that are then taken to the refinery at Concon. Then we have the copper refinery for Codelco. And then we have the power plants of AES Gener, which works with coal. Therefore, this plan was presented by the Ministry of the Environment to the controller's office. And a plan is quite complicated because it involves hundreds of measures, many pages. And if we only took the formalities of the plan, which would be to check if the procedure was applied, if the people that were responsible signed, and if it was applied, we could analyze, in fact, a plan in 15 days, which is the legal term provided by law for the controller's office. But if you actually want to analyze the plan in depth to see if it complies with the objectives for which it was created, of course, 15 days is not enough. Therefore, the analysis did not take place within that term and here we can see how many discussions and how many other aspects were considered for the plan from the environmental authorities. 100 notes or comments were given from the controller's office. However, we continued working with the environmental authority on those comments. However, we got to two important comments that could not be solved by the environmental authorities, and that led to the fact that on December 26 of last year was a very we received a very bad Christmas gift and then the plan was declared as illegal by the controller's office and why was that to explain why it was declared illegal, we need to take into account the following. A decontamination plan is basically based on emissions inventories. And such an inventory only shows what is what are the emissions of certain contaminants. That is what we need to take as a basis. From that point on, I know what is what are the levels that I need to start reducing in order to comply with the regulations. And therefore, we need to look at the specific measures that can allow us to get to a normal environmental situation for that area. With that, there are two groups of comments that the controller's office makes. The first one is displayed on the screen. And I will read it out loud. The, ish, the emission levels provided in the emissions inventory for the specific sources, Codelco, Enap, and Aeskinet, are higher than those that are reported in the technical report of the file. And they were modified through an estimation made by the MMA, supposing, assuming the scenario with the highest environmental impact. And what does this actually mean? You have an emissions uh, inventory saying that the emissions are at 10, but you considered a higher emission because the emissions are higher in the worst case scenario. But what you're issuing is, actu is actually what the emissions are actually low. When the Kyoto Protocol was approved and then they did their carbon uh, inventories, everybody said that their emissions were higher in order to have a greater margin to do this reduction. So there were several scenarios considered by the plan, and let me show you two. The upper line in the chart in purple 
shows the maximum inventory, the one considered in the plan, but the actual inventory is in the light blue line. Therefore, in the plan being used, the inventory being used in the plan is the scenario with the highest environmental impact. This is the companies working 365 days, 24-7 and at full capacity. And if you consider that theoretical scenario, companies generate the ma that level of contamination as a maximum level. However, this has a certain effect in terms of reduction measures. Because if I say that I have emissions for 100, but I actually have 80, and then I have to reduce them to 80, considering that I have 100, then I have nothing to do. So that was the situation that we were experiencing. Let's take the emissions of CO2, of SO2 for Codelco and Ventanas. The plan proposed that from January 1st of the next year of the plan being in force. However, in the previous plan for social and economic impact, the emissions were only of 3,643. I don't know if you understand the problem. The plan says that you can have emissions for 14,650, but you're actually, you actually have emissions of 3,743. Therefore, what did the company have to do? Nothing, because they were compliant from the beginning with these figures that they were presenting. In the case of AES Genet, 15,000 were considered for the same contaminant than the tons per year. That was the maximum, according to the plan. However, in the inventory in the previous project, then the company had emissions for more tons. Therefore, the plan didn't have an impact for that company. Or in the case of ENAP, 2,158 to continue with the same um, contaminant. And the general social impact analysis said that it was it had emissions for 1,700 approximately. So that was what we detected. And I will show you how it concluded, although we all know how the story ended. This is very important. And it has to do with the emissions allowed for boilers. This, it, there is a difference between existing and new boilers. And the definition for existing boilers were not only those that existed when the plan was approved, but all of those that were installed a year after the plan was in force. So there was a kind of a legal fiction in terms of what was considered as an existing boiler. The plan in the upper part of the slide showed existing boilers when they are greater than 20 megawatts with 200 micrograms per um, cubic meter of air for SO2. But in the previous project, it showed 50. And you can see that on the arrows on the left. And therefore, the possibility for emissions is increased in fourfold. And this is a magic number. Why? Because the previous project showed 50. This goes through the minister's council. And then we have 200. So there aren't more explanations to be provided there. Something is happening there because instead of 500, we have 200, four times more for the boiler. You know what happens. Let me add something. This goes through the minister, the, the minister's board. This is for productive sectors, economy, energy, agriculture. Health, well, health is not productive, but it has an impact for the ministries of the productive sector. Therefore, all environmental decisions made in our country 
do not come out of the Ministry of the Environment. They go through the Minister's Council for Sustainability. If you want to pass a, a standard or if you want to approve a decontamination plan, it has to go through this council. And this doesn't have happen in other sectors. If you want to approve a fishing standard, such as the one that I was checking this week that changes the capacity of storage for vessels. It doesn't go through the Council of Ministers for Sustainability, despite the fact that the change in the capacity of storage in a vessel has a huge incidence in biological resources. But that doesn't go through the Council of Ministers. But this is curious because this council, which acts as a filter for all environmental decisions, let me state something that hasn't been stated clearly yet. I believe that the Constitutional Tribunal confused it with the Committee of Ministers that resolves claims, because when it justifies its constitutionality, it says that it's a good thing to have an administrative resource to be presented as the Council of Ministers. An administrative resource is not presented if the sectors can be represented there. And I think that wasn't a good thing because the Constitution says, this is something that I learned by heart, one of the few things that I'm learning by heart because my memory is failing. It must be due to stress. But ministers are the direct and immediate collaborators of the President of the Republic. What does direct mean? And immediate. It means that there's nothing in between. Between a minister and the President who is signing the decree, there shouldn't be anything in between. And then why am I including a council in between, filtering all the decisions? Why do I include this different body? if, according to the institution, there's nothing in between or shouldn't be nothing in between. So at least the constitutionality of that council should have been evaluated. This means that there were very strange changes that took place, and especially these were unjustified. Because if someone says you can have uh, emissions for four times more, there aren't any technical reasons. So what are the consequences? The controller's office states that given the above, the measures for the sources designed based on those levels that are greater to the actual emissions are not translated into um, effective reduction of the contaminants. And therefore, this environmental management instrument does not comply with the purpose assigned by the regulation. So if you have a decontamination plan, you should be applying that. That's what we expected. Therefore, this area has been highly impacted by contamination. This is a port that works with material in bulk, and therefore we have many emissions that are uncontrolled, thus creating an impact in the community. And that leads to an issue in terms of environmental justice. This is equality for how the loads and contaminants are distributed in our country. This is not the only situation. It happens in Tiltil and other smelters. To finish, if we want to talk about the environmental rule of law, we must incorporate the principles of environmental law. And we cannot only stick to the traditional principles that we have, but in terms of environmental equality, we should incorporate it into the analysis. This is for loads and environmental services. 
And all sorts of non-regression, once the protection level is reached, the next modification or regulation should move forward and not go back or move backwards. It should be an effective change and not something merely formal. Otherwise, we'll be full of environmental disputes, as it was uh, reported in the Human Rights Report. And those and the interlocutors, not always are valid interlocutors that will really prove a, a natural environmental interest. Furthermore, I believe that it's highly relevant that the legislator or the MP should realize that the country is environmentally diverse. You cannot have the same instruments applied to the, can, the, the, uh, to the whole country. Once a uh, primary quality standard for the whole country uh, is issued, and one related to the air pollution, of course, we think of Santiago, and standards are set in how Santiago can be relieved or, or prevented from that pollution. But that is not uh, across the board. Otherwise, we'll have environmental conflicts. The decontamination plan of Quintero, Puchuncavi, Quintana will not solve the problem. We need the hourly schedules, uh, for example. We need other rules uh, to prevent a new situation. And this involves reviewing functions and instruments. For example, the rel resolution of uh, environmental relevance or irrelevance, is it? That's an instrument of management. Should it be subject to SEA, A, and it says no? Isn't that an instrument? Can I be so formal to say, as this is not a f an instrument, then it is not controlled by the superintendency of the environment and therefore cannot be reviewed at the environmental tribunal? That remains open. SDGs is a, la is a good navigation chart. We have included them in the controller's office, in our vision, in our strategy, and we monitor that. Uh, and we are part of the auditor board of the UN, only three, Germany, India, and Chile. And of course, we need to set the example as a controller's office. And why for this reason? And this is the same sentence uh, I used two years back. For us in the controller's office, the general controller's office, the good care and uh, of the public uh, resources involves a good care and protection of the environmental resources. It's the same. Thank you. Thank you for the words of the Controller General of the Republic of Chile. Now we begin our second panel of the third International Forum on Environmental Justice. And here we will have the fourth panel, which is uh, Environmental Institutions uh, in Times of Reform. Mrs. Gabriela Burdilis Peruto, Projector Director of the NGO FEMA. And <clears throat> uh, Mr. Hernan Brujer Valenzuela, Executive Director of SEA. Juan Carlos Ferrara Borges, Professor of Administrative Law of the University of Valparaíso, and Bernardo Larraín Mate, President of SOFOFA. The panel will be <clears throat> chaired by Mrs. Carla Vega of the uh, Environmental Tribunal of Santiago. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the fourth panel of this uh, third international forum on environmental justice that's called Environmental Institutions on Times of Reform. There are different bills that are in Parliament 
And for example, there is one that reforms the system of environmental impact assessment. And as the controller said, the bill that creates this uh, unit for biodiversity and protected areas. And it's also relevant because institutional reforms offer great opportunities to advance in transformations and improvements. We are with a great panel here, and thank you for coming here. And I would like to remind you that attendants can raise questions afterwards once the presentations are uh, completed. First, Mr. Nembrucher Valenzuela, Executive Director of the Environmental Assessment Service, uh, he is a lawyer of the Catholic University of Chile, has broad experience in environmental issues, and has been uh, regional ministerial secretary of the environment and in projects uh, on the environment. He was a lawyer of CONAMA, of Valparaíso region, and has been the professor of different masters and undergraduate court. You have 30 minutes for your presentation. Good morning, ministers. I thank you, justices of the court authorities. Truth is that it is uh, a great pleasure, and I thank the invitation to present a subject that indeed is uh, highly debated today, and uh, it was uh, part of the program of President Piñera of uh, implementing modifications. And this has been worked, uh, also had started work in the previous advisory committee to the president. So the idea was to submit a bill and And I would like to tell you about uh, the genesis of this. Uh, Minister Cuvillos uh, uh, talks to different sectors. Many of them had been part of the advisory presidential committee in order to lead or take and trans translate into a bill. And finally, in July of 2018, these modifications are submitted to parliament. In general terms, the diagnosis had been made. The system required adjustments. We are not speaking about a structural reform that was done in 2010, but rather some proposals are collected mainly through the different performance, environmental performance reports that are given to the OCE. And one of the conclusions says that the essential components of environmental regulations in Chile are through the impact assessment, uh, environmental impact assessment system, SEA. And so if this system is the main manage, environmental management instrument still in Chile? That is the question. In 2010, it was said that this system of um, was ex, uh, we based environmental management through this environmental impact assessment system that was exceedingly focused on the system. And therefore, this has an influence on our new bill and also to reflect about criticisms that have been made to this bill. It's not a peaceful system. We have several environmental disputes. And what is it that we want as a final law modifying or adjusting the system of environmental impact? Different points on this we will uh, refer to. To, to what is it that we are proposing. They're uh, not that entertaining, but 
uh, I will refer to them. Modifications for law 19,300, for the law 20,417, and some modifications uh, for environmental tribunals or amendments, that is. We will need consensus because some amendments call for special quorums in parliament, and therefore this calls for an agreement at country level. What is it that we want as a system of environmental impact assessment? Do we want to continue working through the SEA on a case-by-case -case basis, or are we going to preferably use other instruments of superior nature? Let us recall that this system is a third order system, and there are uh, and there are other instruments that should be preferably applied or that will allow for a better environmental management. So let us move on with the subject that has given rise to great debate, macro zones. The idea is to have three macro zones to rate the environmental projects. One is the evaluation, for example, the citizen participation of the local level, the offices at local level, and the assessment of projects with the bodies with environmental competence are the ones that are more not knowledgeable. They know the, com the territory the communities. They will be able to give an effective diagnosis of in environmental assessment. So we maintain, we keep the regional offices but we create macro zones, uh, one macro zone for the north, one for the center, and one for the south. An organization chart which is not alien to our environmental institutions. The tribunals, environmental courts do have competence under this a figure and jurisdiction, so macro zones should also be structured and subject to the jurisdictional control of these courts. Macro zones will be located in Antofagasta, north of the country, in Santiago, and Valdivia. I forget, he said, but he remembered. The makeup of these macro zones will include commissions for rating the project. That is, the executive uh, direction is sort of diluted down. We'll have a big, robust study unit to have guidelines and evaluation criteria for the different regions. And here there will be uh, executive macro zonal guidelines, and, and within them, there will be commissions to rate the projects. We evaluate and assess in the regions, but we rate in the macro zones in these evaluation commissions. And the proposal is into, insofar as the constitution or makeup. Here you have the different areas composing this. They are all of exclusive trust of, for the president of the republic. Nobody has come here uh, as a result of uh, top management contest, but all of them are officials of exclusive uh, appointment by the president. So it is political. There is a political component. They may have some technical skills, but the idea is that it is a political body. Now, if we go back in history in our environmental law, we see that the law 19,300 considered even the courts, the members of regional councils, and these are exclusively political agents or officials that did not have the technical uh, uh, skills, and also governors were included in that council. And we have moved forward now. Where uh, governors have been removed, the courts the, um, have been removed, and today the proposal is to be made up. It is uh, uh, by a commission, a raider, a rating commission, and the idea is that uh, to have the macrozonal director chairing the commission. 
Let us not forget that according to the law of regional governments, it is an official elected uh, uh, with a popular vote, I mean elected by voters. The uh, regional ministerial secretary of the environment and of economy. Professionals, two professionals will be part of this commission, one lawyer and one scientist, and uh, chosen from the top management contest system with very strict criteria and only one member appointed by the President of the Republic. So mixed composition. 50% technical, another 50% political, but not 100% political as it was before. And one member elected through votes. So clearly, we are going along the lines of what the history of environmental law has been in Chile. I want to say that this has not been too peaceful. I've attended different meetings in Congress in uh, here presentations and seminars. And what's clear is that there is no agreement. However, we are analyzing all the possibilities and integration in order to qualify through macro zones and to integrate this commission. Clearly, one of this proposal, which is to eliminate the Council of Ministers, and everybody agrees on this, then the second question is, how can we qualify this? The proposal of the government through the bill is through the macro zone commissions that will be, and also with these members. The bill is subject to discussion. It can be modified. But it is clear that we need to find a solution because we are eliminating the minister's committee as the last instance of claims. We are depolitizing this. However, we need to find a solution. There are some parties that want a, a kind of a board or having a president having the executive director, including only the intendant of the region. However, we need to get to an agreement, and we believe that these macro zone commissions is the most proper choice with geographical aspects within the macro zones, and it will consider them because they will have the jurisdictional control for the administrative acts from these commissions. Therefore, we're currently at a point where we need to make a decision, and the minister's committee will be eliminated. This is the proposal that we have from the government. Technical committees. There were some comments on eliminating the evaluation at a regional level, but it will be maintained with the technical committees, which allow us to engage into rich discussion and technical aspects, because we have all the evaluators participating. We will promote technical committees, the territorial offices as well, in order to have a very good assessment process. And it will be led by the head of the environmental service, and he will have the power to decide on issues um, stated by this technical committee. So we will continue with the assessment at a regional level. And you all know this, and I said this before, there is a consensus on the fact of eliminating the committee of ministers. And of course, the environmental recourse is also eliminated in the administrative aspect. And therefore, we need to know who has the last word in administration issues. And we all agree on the fact that we must eliminate the minister's committee as the last instance. With this, the claim resort is also 
eliminated and then a, a general one is created and more than eliminated the invalidated power is eliminated and there is a judicial recourse the creation of competencies for environmental courts to know about the environmental reference terms in a consultation process that will come from the anticipated citizens' participation. Territorial competencies are also granted. It is quite similar to what we have now with the powers giving granting power for the executive director to qualify a project that has an incidence between macro zones. Participation of municipalities and regional governments. The participation of municipalities is kept. If we intend to leave out municipalities from environmental assessment is not considered in the project. We keep the participation of municipalities in technical aspects, but in terms of citizens' participation, municipalities have a lot to say, and it is included within the environmental impact process. The project must describe their relation with the regional plan that comes with the law of regional governments, and these will be binding. Therefore, they must be considered within territorial compatibility for the corresponding projects. Now, modifications to typologies. This was also taken from the conclusions from the Presidential Advising Committee we have an Article 10 letter C. The only typology, is this the only typology that has magnitude criteria within the law? The rest of typologies has those criteria assigned or coming from the regulation. We will modify and eliminate that to be able to distinguish between the different types of generation because a heat generation is not the same for a photovoltaic or a wind project. And it has an influence on the places in which the project is being located. We will have uh, modifications to the regulation so, so that there is a difference between the different impacts on the project. It is not the same thing to have a three mega project for coal and another one for photovoltaic purposes. And this should be done by the regulation more than the law. Service stations where we have housing projects in saturated areas. The idea is to have a prevention or a decontamination plan. And once this has been stated, it regulates these projects as contaminating sources and that it establishes a compensation method for these projects and not having the environmental assessment impact who must do the environmental management. Therefore, the projects in saturated areas will be assessed only when there is not a decontamination or a prevention plan involved. If these instruments do exist, they must be regulated with them and not use the environmental management through the environmental assessment plan. Biological resources will be, management will be regulated and it will be regulated by other instruments that are within the fishing law and these are left out. The transportation of hazardous material. Here we need to make a difference between impact and risk. In these projects, we, need, we must assess contingency plans and not do an environmental assessment as such. With that, we have a checklist of contingencies and emergencies, and they are basically standardized, and the corresponding regulation should be used for um, the transportation of hazardous materials than storage, but these are issues that are regulated and they do not have to do with impact but with risks. 
And therefore, that is why we propose to eliminate this from the typology. We are also including desalination plants, geothermal protection are also being included within the typologies to be assessed. And in general terms, those are the amendments that we have for Article 10. Then anticipated participation from the community. This, In this aspect, we have made great progress. It will not solve all disputes because the environmental assessment impact is not an instrument to solve all these issues. It is an environmental um, management instrument that makes contract between the environmental aspects of the project with the applicable environmental regulation. As I said, it is not a, an instrument to solve disputes. However, we can promote it. And the next step would be to engage in anticipated citizens' participation. The how involves many opinions, but it is clear that we want anticipated citizens' participation. To which extent and how, that is a question that we will have to state before the Congress. But the government's proposal contains some steps, and the idea is to engage into anticipated discussion with the participation of the state, with the environmental assessment group. We have been stating the Climate Change Commission that has had many good um, methodologies to engage in anticipated citizens' participation. This proposal is for up to 18 months. I don't know if it can last for a shorter period. And the idea is to have citizens participating in the stages of the project. If we look at the requirements for environmental assessment now, we see that there is a detailed engineering that does not allow the community to check environmental alternatives or to make any modifications in the project's engineering because there's there are many years involved in this previous design stage where the engineering is quite a advanced and then it was presenting as a project. It was presented as a project. The idea is that with the territorial knowledge of the communities, we can define between the community and those proposing the project and then with the intervention of public entities, the final stages or the final engineering of the project and to then anticipate to the impact. After the well, this uh, participate, anticipated citizens' participation ends with the territorial notes and the agreements that we have, and then they are registered in SIA with a prior consultation of the environmental court. And then how we do this anticipated citizens' participation is not an easy thing. There are people that want an ongoing, want ongoing claims on judicial locations. And we still haven't started the assessment process as such. These agreements are the basis, and they are not binding for public administration. It doesn't mean that because we have environmental terms in this prior stage, everything will be moved to the assessment process. The regulation component can be um, reviewed by public services. And within the legal framework, they are at their discretion to check all assessment issues. One thing is the anticipated citizen's participation, and another thing is the evaluation process or the assessment process that will continue as it is today. There are principles that will rule this citizen's participation, um, good faith, willingness to engage in dialogue, and I repeat, the results are not binding. Are Do we have any 
criticisms. Yes, we agree on the fact that we must have anticipated citizens' participation. The thing is how, and this is the government's proposal. Anticipated citizens' participation is mandatory based on the proposal for the environmental assessment periods. After this anticipated citizens process, we have the assessment itself up to 18 months for anticipated citizens participation. And then we have uh, two years to present the assessment project. After that period, we need to redo the process. Citizen participation decreases uh, to 30 days in the impact assessment studies, given that citizen participation already exists, and these are time limits that will be defined in the bill, and if necessary, to modify, they will. But those, uh, it goes down from 60 to 30 days, understanding that, of course, there was a previous citizen participation. Citizen participation is maintained. But the concept of environmental burden is eliminated. They need to be, have uh, uh, environmental burden so as to have citizen participation. So today, this concept of uh, if the project does or not have uh, environmental burden, and there will be citizen participation when requested for these uh, um, uh, impact, environmental impact uh, statements. Uh, citizen participation is maintained if there are substantive uh, modifications of the bill. Uh, there is a definition uh, on essential key information, relevant information for the uh, bill. This will be regulated with the idea of giving certainty and avoid uncertainties in that in one region they gave me uh, previous or cancellation, immediate cancellation or termination and in other region I was given, uh, I was not given that termination. And this it goes with the these are the environmental requirements of sectoral permits, and those permits that are non-environmentalized. For example, decree, supreme decree, 43 storage of dangerous substances that is reviewed in the evaluation process, but it is uh, uh, then afterwards, it's out of uh, of the environmental arena. I mean, if you are giving a pass, uh, well, this will be along with the rating, environmental rating. There are sectoral permits that will never be completely environmentalized. Uh, a permit or an authorization for construction of works in the district cannot be included in the system. And uh, all these permits that call for lots of detailed information that cannot be included in the assessment process. But the idea is to provide certainty as to the uh, granting of these authorizations or passes. And then this uh, environmental rating system if environmental variables have not uh, uh, performed uh, well, this is open for statements, for monitoring. You have the possibility to request this, and this. There are very few cases that have been heard. This is not an effective instrument. This is a very slow process. Very few review, reviews of environment and environmental rating have existed. The idea when you want to be revisited or reviewed. And uh, this 
<clears throat> the idea is, uh, is to give greater mobility to the resolution of environmental rating. Greater expediency, sometimes it's exceedingly closed and does not allow for modifications in environmental management. They are necessary, yes, but the instrument uh, does not uh, fulfill its mission. And then finally, the mandatory perspectives. Uh, relevance or irrelevance, uh, for example, if it's not relevant, it does not go into the system. Today, the revel relevance or non-relevance are true uh, uh, subject to true evaluations. And in the, in the bill, the idea is not to hide uh, information or it's not having a complete uh, modification. But the idea is, for example, I submit uh, uh, such a project, not a treatment, uh, treatment plant <laughs> or sanitation treatment plant. Well, if I submit whatever project I submit, of course, I will resolve bearing in mind all the information submitted by the holder, the environmental system just cannot control. So I will have an administrative action with that information. The superintendency will always exercise its controlling uh, powers and of monitoring if there is um, uh, if they are, it's not completely true or they are hiding some information. If the project is X and I do X, I'll be respected in my relevance. And uh, even uh, this includes the project uh, evaluators, of course. This is the spirit behind this relevance. Uh, uh, it's not that I say X and then I will do Y, then I'm no longer relevant. And these are, mm, uh, there are very few resolutions, only three cases of the environmental assessment system of resolutions that can be divided. Uh, here, for example, a transmission line and uh, a power station. And uh, of course, we can divide impacts there. It's not that I have the, uh, in the power station, I will ha have the turbine uh, divided from the canal or the reservoir. No, no, no. If we can distinguish impacts and measures, then th the resolution could be divided. But we will have a control measure that establishes solidarity regarding uh, previous facts that could be sanctioned. It's not if I, 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 I dividing resolutions and forget about the superintendency. This is like uh, tax issues or labor issues. The acquirer uh, of these um, uh, are all included. There is uh, control measures so as to avoid evading and not complying resolutions of uh, the environmental original rating. This is in general terms, all the matters for the project, it's clear that it's not one single approach. There are different views and the minister has given signals in that she is willing to go talk, discuss everywhere so that we may make an adjustment to the environmental impact assessment system. The idea is to provide certainty to citizens, improve citizens' coexistence, and of course, effectively protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Now, Professor Juan Carlos Ferrara Borges, He's a lawyer of the University of Chile and uh, a, a PhD of 
law from the University of Madrid, of the University in the south of Chile, and Valparaíso. From March, he's a member, uh, ju justice of the Court of Valparaíso. He is the author of different publications. He, professor, you have 30 minutes for your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Can I take remove this from here, please? No, 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 you can't. Yeah, let it not fall. <laughs> Good morning. Of course, first I'd like to thank the invitation of the Environmental Court of Santiago and the Chief Justice Alejandro Ruiz Favres for this invitation to the third international Forum on Environmental Justice, which, of course, for me, it is a true honor. And uh, really, my area of work is administrative law, not environmental law. However, I always go through it, but from the perspective of administrative law. And it's also an honor because of the uh, very renowned speakers that we've had and the many ideas, very useful and relevant ideas we've heard yesterday and today. Of course, this is a privileged forum because you can <clears throat> discuss issues of environmental policy and of environmental law. And in this case, the reforms that are being raised or considered for environmental institutions and also environmental justice. And along these lines, what I will do is mainly analyze and I'm going to analyze this project or this bill, but viewed from a different perspective. The bill uh, submitted by the government to parliament in July of last year, and I will examine it from the point of view of the problems that our environmental institutions present. And if those problems that have been considered in different fora, academ academia, political or social, if those problems are solved, settled finally in this bill or no. And of course, this presentation is from the academic standpoint. And this provides me with a lot of freedom and lack of responsibility because I'm elected by no one. I just have a position as professor in a public institution. And unless the principal or the dean will throw me out, well, apart, <laughs> I, but don't worry, don't worry. I will not say anything incorrect that will, you will feel sorry you had invited me. Only a few things. Well, anyhow, out of the discussion raised in different fora, I would say that there are six problems, or arbitrarily, I detected six problems that are inherent to our environmental institutions. The first one, I think that the first problem is that there is a perception uh, that there is tremendous social conflict in the analysis and assessment of projects with environmental impact. It is well known that there is a general perception from different players for different reasons that every time a bill with the environmental impact is processed, great political and social conflicts are generated. You have manifestations, demonstrations, technical, political debates, and uh, uh, very uh, many judicial uh, rejection procedures. 
For example, Minera Dominga, these are the projects that have really been uh, rejected because of social conflicts. Linea Electrica Carbone, so I mean, that's a coal plant. Uh, terminal 2 of Valparaíso, which is a seaport. I see the problem every single day there. All these projects have generated tremendous uh, public exposure and conflict. This had, has led to the general view that the submission and approval of projects with the environmental impact by business community says that all of this processing is one relevant element, relevant element desensitivating private investment. It is said that this, all these conflicts lead to lack of incentives to invest in development. A second uh, issue submitted by the uh, business community is that the very late approval, it says that the processing evaluation is an excessive length. I mean, it, it takes too, too long. And report number three, surely Mr. Larraín knows it very well. Uh, uh, and this is uh, w distinguishing among the different studies of impact assessment studies said that its extent exceeded the conventional one. I mean, today it's slower than before. Data tell us that a project that is subject to impact assessment lasts in average 23.4 months, two years. And that means, uh, compared to 2015, those are comparative data I have, is 10% uh, longer than the previous year and 39% than the period 2007 to 2015. So the length of these uh, assessments and studies has increased in 40 percent. And this could be analyzed by sectors where there is greater conflict or greater uh, duration. The most conflictive area or where greater uh, length uh, of studies is mining, the mining area. Most complications arise from there. If you go to, uh, or of course, projects have taken longer. Today, it's around 18 months that an approval uh, would take 18 months. And this is 20% more than the period 27 to, uh, to 2007-2015, so 20 percent longer. Again, so you can perceive that there is a feeling that the evaluation and the approval of projects increases uh, and extends the time, and therefore the system is not efficient, not well, very little efficient. The, 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 the iconic example that took the longest and longest and politically had greater impact was the Minera Dominga that began in 2013, the processing, and it took f and ended in 2017. Four years uh, uh, took the evaluation of the project, and finally it was rejected after four years. A third problem that is raised frequently, the lack of appropriate mechanisms of citizen participation in the discussion uh, of these projects. In this perspective with different players, it sustains that in the, the Chilean system of citizens' participation is inefficient attaining the nature of large investments and with the citizens in this sense. So FOFA created a document called Proposals to Improve the Environmental Assessment Process. And it says, quote, that the, institu the environment institution is not calling correctly citizens' participation and those those part of the environment for 
the interest of investors. Some NGOs have stated that the current citizens' participation process does not gather properly the levels of representativeness of the different organizations in the territories, and on the other hand, it doesn't gather properly the participations of some special communities or communities that have different interests in the approval of certain projects, particularly indigenous communities where, in fact, there is a fact in the problem of participation that hasn't been solved properly. From my point of view, with the corresponding regulation that intends to apply Agreement 169 of the ILO. The Presidential Advisory Committee of President Bachelet mentioned that this was one of the problem points of the environmental institution. And let me read a paragraph of this report talking about citizens' participation. Citizens' participation in the framework of the CEA is facing a, s a series of questionings and criticisms for the expected results. The previous is related to the implementation of the procedures and terms with problems that are not related to environmental assessment, but with a typology of specific project or with what is related to the emplacement of the initiative in a certain territory, close quote. Therefore, there is a general perception that the participation mechanism foreseen in this environmental assessment system is not proper in order to solve these problems. A fourth problem that I would like to point out says that there is an improper institutionality to solve conflicts. And here the main criticism has been that the institutional system for solving conflicts is not very coherent with the institutional designer model. The controller was stating that there are different entities involved in environmental decisions the superintendents, the Ministry of the Environment, the um, Environmental Assessment Service, the Ministry of the Environment and Environmental Corps were mentioned. He put there the Supreme Court also and the Controller's Office. The feeling is that this institutional design is very complex and therefore it leads to different answers. This is something that happens in administrative law. And I'm thinking about Chile. There is a certain forum shopping in terms of where I go and which type of answer I get. And therefore, I generate many times contradictory mechanisms in terms of how I obtain a final resolution for an environmental conflict. This leads to an idea of legal uncertainty in terms of the mechanisms established. But apart from that, there is a certain feeling, and it was expressed by the director of SEA, that the internal administrative resources mechanism is not proper to solve these conflicts. There is a fifth problem also mentioned by the director of SEA, and it is that there is a feeling in citizens, and it's quite reasonable, that there is a politicization of the technical decision when qualifying a project with environmental impact. In this sense, it is said that this environmental institutionality with a committee of ministers in the upper part leads to discredit the technical evaluation coming from the Environmental Assessment Service and makes the decision more related to politics in the sense that we have a um, politician involved both in the regional and then in the national aspect. Therefore, a reasonable thing to do would be to eliminate that political instance to leave the qualification of the project as a technical issue. 
And to finish, there is a last problem, which is that there are certain restrictions to the access to environmental justice. And those restrictions have to do basically due to an active legitimation that is quite restrictive, established by law 20,600 for people to go to environmental courts. And as Minister Muñoz said, with a restrictive interpretation of the protection resort, and the minister said that it was in very good condition and that it was a great alternative to the environmental court. And I do not agree with that. It doesn't have a good condition, fortunately. And secondly, I do not believe that it is an alternative to environmental institutionality, as I will explain in a couple of minutes. So which are the proposals of the project? And let's see if they respond to these issues. A relevant thing is the restructuring with a reduction of the political component at the maximum level possible within the institutionality through these macro zones and these macro zone um, committees and executive directors. The truth is that the proposal stated by the government in this bill lead to several questions and problems. First of all, I understand that the project intends to leave aside the political incidents in the approval of the project. However, if you look at the composition of these macro zone committees, we don't see that. There isn't, we, we do not see political participation being left out. We have sec uh, secretaries of the region which are appointed by the president. We have three out of seven members appointed by the president and then we have the regional, the new regional governor and we do not know if this position will exist because it will be part of a reform in 2020. But politicians are fighting that still. Therefore, four out of seven members are pure politicians. Three represent the president of the republic, and then we have the regional um, governor elected by citizens. And it is also stated with a participation of two people related to technical aspects. One is related to science and the other one to legal aspects. And part of the intervention of what we currently have in environmental course is delegated. And then there is a very strange thing happening. There is a technical qualification in these zone courts, and then we will have a legal one. So will we believe the technical experts of the environmental court to those and the zones and why because it is better to be part of an environmental court instead of a zone macro zone committee so we have people with different profiles from different entities working here therefore the political component as proposed isn't abandoned and this is determined by the existence of the zones according to the jurisdictional territories of the tribunals. And we must be careful with that. The structure of environmental courts with three large zones is justified only due to two reasons. First, of course, due to budgets because there wasn't the intention of creating environmental tribunals or courts in the entire country and probably because the level of conflict do not need to have um, courts all over the country. And that's why these three macro zones were created. Now, if I leave the qualification out of the specific zone where the conflict is, I don't think the reason is the same. Then a second thing stated by the project 
has to do with redesigning institutionality mechanisms. As the director of SEA was saying, the administrative recursive um, means by the minister of committees or the executive committee of SEA has. If we eliminate the minister's committee, we cannot continue with the resort. But we should look at this from the point of view of to see if it is reasonable to eliminate this. And in this sense, the project is going on the opposite direction of the, in, uh, the administrative law in general. This makes sense to have a claiming process before the judicial, applying judicial aspects. And it makes a sense. It has two purposes. On one side, because it is estimated that the administrative um, option is cheaper than the judicial aspect because citizens do not need to hire an expert attorney because justice is expensive because good attorneys are expensive. We are expensive. So the administrative recourse um, option is an option that citizens have without having to hire attorneys. And they are different from the judicial option. In the administrative one, not only the legality of a decision can be reviewed, but also the merit, because it is part of the competency of this option. And therefore, the law that was modified in 2013 didn't eliminate the recourse option. And this came from Spain, and I don't agree with this. Trying to bring in a Spanish doctrine, what it did is to provide an alternative saying that you could have two different options, administrative and judicial. But it didn't eliminate it because it is provided as a reasonable option, understanding also the powers of review. However, this project does the opposite because it is eliminating it. And it becomes the, the only option is the court, which is much more expensive for citizens. And that option for the courts will state another problem. Then I will go to the court to review the project. And there, I will not only review the legality of the project, but also the merit. And that has been a source of constant tension stated in the environmental court in the sense to see if what is the scope of competence of the court, because it checks the legality of the administrative decision or also the merit. I believe that the institutional design of the court leads to that question and the design of a law saying that apart from legal consideration, we must also consider technical aspects. And that leads to a problem because I'm transforming a jurisdictional that is supposed an instance that is supposed to be jurisdictional also into an instance with a decision of merit. This is an ongoing problem in our country. When we design institutions such as the competence, free competition uh, court, for instance, if we, we still do not make our, up our minds to adhere to the British or to the French system, we are in between. Therefore, we have an environmental court, and we do not know if it is a tribunal or an agent or an agency. We do not know if it is a tribunal or a court because it is in between. And that leads to the problem that we have with the Supreme Court, where they have a tendency to try to be a tribunal or a court because it does not only review the legality of the decision of uh, the environmental court being a cassation court, but it also goes into the merit of the project. I hope that Minister Munoz doesn't hear this, but that problem becomes evident. A third issue to close my presentation 
in the project as the CIA director was saying, is to strengthen and broaden the instances of citizens' participation with this anticipated citizens' participation mechanism. The truth is that I don't understand this part of the project, to be honest. I do not understand the purpose of early or anticipated participation. If the objective is to put people engage people in the discussion of the project to have some kind of incidents in the project, then it doesn't benefit the investors because this project will be modified and therefore they will just take it as a reference for what comes later. If the objective is to reduce citizens' participation in a later stage, it doesn't attain it because the project does not exclude citizens' participation, it just states it as an alternative. Therefore, I do not believe that the reference terms for this anticipated participation can delimit um, citizens' participation in a later stage. In fact, I don't think that not even investors can argue that what was said by those groups that participated in an anticipated stage could stop those organizations from demanding different things. If the objective is to reduce or limit that participation, I believe that the project is not taking the right approach. Apart from that, that anticipated citizens' participation has some very considerable technical design issues. It has some reference terms, and the bill says that they will go to consultation before the environmental court for their authorization. What does that mean? Is that like the criminal consultation? that was done before, or are we talking about this consultation in terms of the authorization in Law 20600 for environmental courts? It's not clear to me. And what is the Environmental Tribunal going to do with that consultation? Authorize it? Authorize what? Authorize the procedure that was conducted according to certain formal patterns. They cannot refer to the substance of it, only the procedure. And why authorizing the, the procedure? Will it limit the tribunal or not? And what if the tribunal does not ap uh, approve it, rejects it, whatever? I mean, because it, didn't, it was, did not agree on how it was settled and so forth. Can you you go to the Supreme Court have, uh, because of rejection of the environmental tribunal? It would seem no, because it's not contemplated. But then the, the situation is difficult. The, the environmental tribunal is in a difficult standing to approve something do not, that does not know the defects or effects. If I were a member of the approval of the Environmental Tribunal, I would just approve and avoid all kinds of problems. But I think that is pointless to, I mean, to exhaust an institution in, a, in something that has no effect. And then, finally, the bill tries to correct certain deficits in access to environmental justice. I believe that this uh, project tries to make a good contribution insofar as solving the problem of intervention of third parties that have not participated in the environmental complaint, solving this problem with uh, the inadequate invalidation generated by the Supreme Court. However, beware of what can come out of that statement. The bill says that any natural legal person will be legitimized if that has been affected directly. <laughs> Uh, really, with this, closes the door to the Supreme Court. I don't know if, if Justice Munoz realized that. It closes the possibility of intervention only or reduces it only to those that have specific environmental interests and directly 
direct environmental interest. The Supreme Court failed against in the Sokimit case. So this is totally uh, opposite to what the criterion followed by the Supreme, to what was the criterion followed by the Supreme Court. And uh, another issue is the time limit for for challenging or questioning the the. Uh, decision uh, 30 days uh, and that's it quite reasonable because it used to be 60, 180 that is so irrational that it has done is big, or it took two years the project and therefore case law has created other mechanisms like legitimate trust good faith and a series of poetries and that was the response to this enormous delay of the two years for approval of the impact, uh, environmental impact assessment. I believe that the bill is, go is on the right track, is moving forward, yes, indeed, but has lots of technical deficits, deficiencies that need to be corrected. I guess Congress there has a key job, and it is a wasted opportunity to really tackle issues that continue to exist in the environmental institutional it doesn't settle the problem of participation, the problem of times, uh, and does not solve an issue which is the institutional design in environmental justice. The problem between the sentence of, of, of environmental tribunal and the Supreme Court that needs to be tackled. We need to fill in that gap in view and see what are the powers of the Supreme Court. I mean, if you have a technical environmental tribunal and then environmental complaints and recourse of protection, I guess those issues should have been tackled and they were not. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ferrada. You're all invited to coffee so as to come back with the next two presentations.